quick logistics to run through. Um, we do hope to have time for Q&A, so please chat in any question that, that you have via the chat. Please make sure to send them to me, the host, as well as the panelists, and we will go through some questions at the end. Um, if the chat is not visible on the right-hand panel of your screen, you can access it by clicking the little thought bubble on the bottom row of your screen. Um, slides will be slides and recording will be available on the CSAC website after the webinar, so you'll be able to access those again. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to DOH, and we're going to get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, and we apologize for the delay. I had some technical difficulty. So this is Colette Pullen from the Department of Health, and I'm going to present the slides and the overview of the HCBS level of care eligibility determination. And then we have our state partners and other folks that will assist in answering questions and other items as we go through. And There we go. I figured out how to move the button. So again, today we're just going to quickly go over the timeline. So there's a little bit of changes there, the eligibility purpose, and then go through the determination process. We also have some UAS screenshots so that you can be familiar with some of the items. We're going to go over briefly eligibility for Medicaid and then share with you some up, up um, date to some training schedule. So the first thing is um, our timeline. And as you can see here, there's a note in red for a number of items. So we are plugging along. Um, we did um, launch our first three um, children and family treatment support services in January. And those agencies are moving forward and have been working hard the last couple months, making sure our children are in those services and are getting the services that they need. Um, and all of you have been working really hard to transition your waiver children over to health home care management services. And um, that due date is fastly approaching for March 31st. So thank you all for your hard work. I'm sure all the children and families appreciate what you're doing for them. And um, any way we can help um, till March 31st, please let us know. And then we do have um, what we're all working towards is our April 1st launch of the new Consolidated Children's Waiver. And um, yes, it's still pending CMS approval. We think we're really, really close with them. Um, but we are moving forward for April 1st. And then you can see there in July, there's a lot of activities happening there that you can review. But the biggest change is in red there, and uh, in um, the HCBS services and some of the behavioral health, um, the voluntary foster care agencies, all moving into Medicaid managed care has been changed um, to October 1st. So there will be a lot of information coming out about that, um, training and information and contracting. And I think this will be good to give um, the managed care plans and providers time to do the necessary things that they need to do to get to October since there's so many activities that are happening right now um, in the last couple months. So we want to go over the new children's waiver that is launching on April 1st. And as you all are hopefully aware, we are consolidating these six listed um, waivers, the 1915C waivers, and to one 1915C waiver, which is called the children's waiver. So that will begin, and all of you that are um, working in these waivers and are providers for these current waivers, are doing your um, your great job, as I mentioned, to um, move the children for to prepare for April 1, this um, launch of the new children's waiver. And so what is the designer goal here behind all of this? Is really to break down some silos and to have streamlined processes 
to make sure that all children, regardless of the door they enter, can get a set of services all the same and that it is not dependent on what door you walk in. And also to assist providers that there's one rate, one service description, that there's one way to do business, there's one state agency with all our state partners working together in collaboration to monitor their services, and once again, that it does not matter what door the child enters, they, if they're eligible for HCBS, they can get any of the services that meet their needs and that, um, <clears throat> that would be helpful to them and to get them to better outcomes instead of just based on a specific door or a specific waiver. So that is our goal with combining the waivers into this children's waiver. And I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. This is our basis here with the children's design, is that the care management will be provided through the health home. So if you're HCBS eligible, you're automatically health home eligible. You do not need to prove health home eligibility and appropriateness because HCBS LOC, level of care, is a higher bar, so to speak. And then children who are in health home, so all the children that are in health home today are not automatically um, HCBS eligible. They need to go through the process that we're gonna walk through today on this webinar. And then for children who lose their HCBS, they will potentially lose their health home care management unless separate eligibility for health home and appropriateness is determined. And again, the goal of this design, with the children's waiver design, is to make sure that once a child is HCBS eligible, then they're eligible for the entire array of HCBS services beginning April 1st. So many of you have been transitioning children and you have hopefully been working on their plan of care to do a crosswalk to prepare them for um, April 1st so that they will have the new set of services on their plan of care. Now, when you're doing this plan of care, of course, it has to be based on need and that it's, um, you have the right services for the right need of the child and that there's no duplication of services and it's really trying to get the child to their personal goals and outcomes um, for wellness and health. So again, beginning April 1, so I used to say different dates over and over again, so my new date is beginning April 1. Children and adolescents who are already in Medicaid, so they are already Medicaid eligible, then they will be referred to the health home for HCBS determination. For those children who are not enrolled in Medicaid, we'll go to our independent entity of CES. So we do have um, an independent entity CES webinar coming up in the uh, next couple weeks to talk about what they will be doing in the new world. So stay tuned to more information about that. But Health Home and CES will be working with the children and the families and providers to determine HCBS eligibility. So if you're in Medicaid, you're going to be referred to Health Home because you can already be enrolled in a health home because you have Medicaid, and if you do not have Medicaid but you believe um, or a provider believes or a family believes that the child would benefit from HCBS, then they will be referred to CES. And again, there is no um, wrong door here, so any child um, under the age of 21 uh, that meet eligibility um, have the opportunity to receive HCBS services. There's no exclusion group or anything like that. You just need to meet eligibility. And it's really important that people understand that children in foster care are categorically eligible for Medicaid. So regardless of their insurance of their parents, if they're in foster care, they are Medicaid. And then our HCBS eligibility determination is in the UAS along with our CANS New York for Health Home. And this um, is part of the CANS and will determine um, level of care. It's also important to note since currently we have 
there's waivers and everybody does things just a little bit different. That in the new world of April 1, only health home care managers, CES, and the DDRO can determine HCBS level of care. So that's really important to understand that your processes may be changing for April 1. The LOC HCBS eligibility um, criteria, as I just said, will replace any tool or waiver tool that you do today or that someone else may do for children to get into your waiver. And then um, it's really also important that not all children in Medicaid or all children in health home would benefit for HCBS. So for those of you who are care managers on the phone and that you've been serving children in the health home program, it is not our intent that every child in the health home program will get an HCBS level of care determination made on them. It's really based on their needs. And so we're going to have a lot more information in other webinars for things for you to consider and um, the types of children and the types of needs children may have that would really benefit from HCBS. And the reason for that is because we really need to understand the purpose of HCBS. And the purpose of HCBS is to meet those high-level kids' needs to make sure that they are able to stay at home in their community and not go to a higher level of care. So these are for children that are really struggling in our community um, to stay stable, that, that you know they're at risk of being hospitalized, institutionalized, and we want them to have the right services so that does not happen to them. And then also for those children who are in already in a higher level of care, that they can safely return home into their community and that these services will enable them to do that and be able to then remain in the community and with their families. The last piece in the purpose is really based on the children's consolidated waiver is to expand the array of services available to children and adolescents to really have a better outcome for them and to make sure that more children can stay in their home and community and be successful. So let's just talk about the tool now. We're gonna, we went over kind of the foundation, the premise of the children's waiver, and now we wanna talk about the tool and how it operates. Um, so just like the CANS New York, the HCBS tool, the level of care tool, is part of a collaborative process with the children and the family to obtain the necessary information um, to determine eligibility. We want to be person-centered, right, and develop a person-centered plan of care. So the first step to getting there is really sitting down with families and understanding their needs, their strengths, areas they want to work on, and what are some struggles they're having. So this is the conversation our care managers and CES and the DDROs have to have with families, gathering the right information and documentation so that the eligibility for HCBS can be determined. The tool itself in the UAS is like a decision tree instrument in the sense that you have to complete one section and have the proper documentation and information to support that for you to move on to the next section of the assessment. So what I will tell you is that since I've been um, working with the UAS team um, for this tool to be built, that once you get familiar with the tool and you go in you into the UAS and you do some training and um, you start to understand how it works, you'll realize very quickly that you'll be able to um, go out and gather all the documentation, have that person conversation with the family, talk with providers, you'll be able to gather all the documentation and information that you need so that you can go into the UAS HCBS level of care tool and probably complete it all at once or have to go in um, just a couple of times versus on each step going in and clicking a button. So, and the decision tree is based on these three factors. There are three components you see there. First, you have to meet the target population. So the child needs to meet the target population. 
then the risk factors, and then what we call the um, functional criteria. It's important to know that there's these four target populations, as we're calling them, and that we understand that children may fit um, more than one of these um, target populations, but you only need to go through one process. So um, <clears throat> that's important to note. You don't have to do multiple processes because a child has multiple diagnoses or other issues. So again, it's really important that you have that conversation with families and providers and gather the right documentation so that you can move forward in the portal. Each of the target populations specifically outline diagnoses, conditions, and requirements. And then again, you need the supporting documentation um, in the child's record. So nothing is uploaded in the UAS. That platform doesn't have that ability. This is you going through the UAS tool, um, documenting or checking the right, I will say checking the right boxes to, um, based on the documentation you have, and then placing that documentation in the file so that when there is a case review or audit, it will support what you've selected in um, the UAS. A couple general rules about HCBS eligibility is that it must be completed face-to-face. -face. So there has to be at least one face-to-face -face with the child. And we have the link there to the HCBS requirements. So that's really important for you to understand. The other thing is that HCBS eligibility is once you're eligible for HCBS, it's an annual determination. So those of you who are care managers um, know that you do your complete your CANs every six months. So regardless of your CANs being completed in those timelines, HCBS will not be impacted. So you can have an HCBS eligibility determination, and then you could have multiple CANs throughout the year, um, and that will not impact the HCBS eligibility timeline. So that's really important to know, and the UAS, can, um, as it does for the CANs, will let you know when that HCBS eligibility determination is coming up or will be due. So if there is a member or a child who is, who is found eligible for HCBS, and then they refuse to have HCBS or they leave HCBS services because maybe they feel like they're doing better and they have the right connection with providers. And then later they come back and they say, I really need HCBS services. Then you will have to redetermine them. So the one year is not a golden path, so to speak. It's one year if you remain in the services. If you leave the services, then you will have to be redetermined eligible. And then if a child is found not to be eligible, there's no time limit or wait period for them to be determined eligible or not eligible again. So, you know, if a family is determined not to be eligible, maybe they're involved with health home care management or other providers, and then something significant happens in the child's life, and they may come back, the family or providers, to ask for the eligibility determination to be done again. And so you can do that if you're a health home care manager, CES, or the DDRO. Um, so there's no wait period that once you've been not found eligible that you have to wait a certain period of time before you can do the tool again. Now, similar to the CANS New York, there is a significant life change where even though it's an annual determination that you may have to do the HCBS eligibility earlier than one year. And you can see here that these are the reasons. So that if a child um, has one of these things happen in their lives where they have a different caregiver or their caregiver um, capacity or their situation has significantly changed or the child is hospitalized, then you will need to do a new HCBS eligibility determination. And once you do a new HCBS eligibility determination, then the one year would start over. 
So as an example, you have an HCBS eligibility determination that is started, let's say, in April of 2019, and then the child is hospitalized, unfortunately, of course, in July of 2019, and then they leave hospital inpatient in August, and you complete the HCBS eligibility determination in August, then your new one-year timeline has started from the August date instead of the April. Date. So it's really important, I've already said the word documentation quite a bit, that you must have documentation to support your LOC findings. So as you go through target risk and the functional criteria, you will need to ensure you have the proper documentation to support everything that you are saying is occurring with the family within the UAS. <clears throat> it will be really important for the health home care manager and CES to work with all the health care professionals to obtain this documentation for eligibility and making sure that it's in the member's file to um, for any audits or review case reviews. It's also important that diagnosis law alone is not enough or not sufficient. So we've had these challenges in the health home program that it's really important that you understand the target populations and what is require, required. So it's important that you not only have that diagnosis diagnosis if it's um, required, but that you have the documentation from a licensed professional and all the required documents that support um, what you're checking off in the determination, eligibility determination. You may have to assist providers and professionals in the community to explain what's going on with this transformation and that things are changing, or just maybe they've never worked with the waiver program. Now that we're outreaching to more children, to have more services to more available to more children, there may be professionals that have not really worked with a waiver service previously. So it's important that you communicate well with professionals and providers that children are involved with, and you explain the type of documentation that you need so that they can really help facilitate the eligibility process for you. It's important that we don't want to send children to other providers because providers don't know what's going on or can't help us. It's really our job to help facilitate that conversation and explain what we're trying to do for the child. And of course, that professional who's involved with the child will be part of your plan of care and your multidisciplinary team. So it's really important that you're able to engage those providers and professionals it, um, across the whole life of the case versus just the eligibility. So that is a primary goal of our health home care managers and CS is to be able to engage those providers to help make this determination. The other thing that's very important is the role and the function of CS and the health home care manager is not to make determinations throughout the process, but rather collecting the information to verify target population, risk factors, and functional criteria. There will be a number of forms that will need to be completed while the child is getting eligible or directly after they are found eligible for HCBS, and those um, forms will be forthcoming. So let's go through uh, the tool. The first thing you need to do in this decision tree process is target population. So for those of you who are already in the UAS for the CANS, you'll notice that things look very similar. And if a child has CANS, our tool is already completed, you can add an HCBS tool um, to their record, and you'll be able to see CANS and HCBSs. Yeah, HCBS tools. So they are not in like separate areas um, of the UAS. They are connected to the child, the member, and you will be able to see all the different assessments that have been done, whether there are CANS or a UAS. You will see here that all the four target populations are listed, and then you'll just need to uh, select the target population that you will be working on. 
So the first thing is I'm going to go through all four target populations. And if you read our waiver and all the other documents, you probably have seen this before. So our first one is SED, serious emotional disturbance. All the children in our waiver have to be either ages, um, ages zero up until the 21st birthday. So that is the same for each of the target populations. And then you see here for SED, means a child and adolescence has diagnosis of mental illness. Um, according to the DSM, and has experienced a functional limitation due to emotional disturbance over the past 12 months. And then it gives you a list of functional um, limitations um, that must be moderate in at least two areas um, or severe in one. So I want to be really clear, this is the same definition for health home. So it should look really familiar. It's your job as a care manager to obtain the diagnosis from a licensed mental health professional. And then the mental health professional needs to um, outline that the child has met the functional limitations and that they have determined that the child is SED. So a mental health diagnosis alone and you reviewing a psychosocial and you assuming that they meet one of these bullets is not appropriate or sufficient. This has to all be done by a licensed professional or letting you know what needs to be done so you can collect the appropriate information. It's really important that everybody understands in each of these target populations, there's this functional limitation. Remember that this HCBS services are for high need kids. So not only do they have a diagnosis, but their diagnosis or their concerns that they have are impacting their daily living, right? Um, and that's what we want to get to, the services that will help them be able to function within their diagnosis. So step three, so to speak, is that these are the diagnosis categories. So the child needs to um, have, this di have a diagnosis and then meet the functional limitation. And the licensed professional needs to determine that they are SED. Okay, so you'll need to talk to some professionals and explain that to them so you have the right documentation. We also want to just alert everyone that previously the health home SED definition and the SED definition for OMH and HCBS were not aligned, and we have now aligned those. So there is no difference, as I mentioned. The SED definition that we're showing you here is the SED definition um, and process for health home. And as you can see there, um, there used to be where it says new in the right-hand collar. Those used to be no's, and now we have aligned um, the SED. So again, children who are currently SED in health home may potentially be eligible for HCBS. And you see a screenshot here that it also lists the categories that you will have to select. So once again, you'll need to have that dialogue with that licensed professional to make sure that they have a diagnosis, that they meet the functional limitation, and that they have the determination in writing that the person, the child, is SED. And then our friends from OMH gave you some suggestions that in a um, psychiatric evaluation, psychological assessment, or a psychosocial assessment might be some ways that a licensed practitioner um, can give you this information. Um, and again, as I just mentioned, if the documentation does not explicitly articulate SED criteria, then you need to have a discussion with that licensed professional to make sure that they have both the diagnosis and determine that they have some functional limitations as outlined. Again, it's not your role as a health home care manager or CES to determine whether or not the child has SED. 
It's really your job to collect the information and have verification for the eligibility process that you will be going through. So our next target population is our medically frail population. All right, and you'll see again, it's zero to age 21 birthday. And again, you need to have a documented physical disability. And this can be managed by, or, um, by these three items that are outlined here. So it's really important that people understand the definition of medically frail and that children who have chronic del deliberating conditions and con or conditions who may or may not be hospitalized or institutionalized and meet more one or more of the following criteria. So once again, you have the uh, determination that you are physically disabled and that there is a functional limitation that has to be met. And here we put all the links to the various tools. So, of course, the first one is an SSI certification. This is determined through the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance and their um, New York State Supplemental Program. And this is a process that a child and family needs to go through to determine whether or not they meet SSI disability. So. This can sometimes be a lengthy process, um, but we give you the website here in the process so that you can educate families on what they may need to do um, or that you can help um, coordinate for them. The other, or what you could do is have the LDSS 639 disability certification completed. So this goes to a review team to um, have this completed and determine that the child is physically disabled. Or the last part is you could have these three other forms completed, which is the childhood medical report, the questionnaire on school performance, the description of the child's activity report. These three reports completed by the right appropriate people um, can get you to the certification of physical disability. And you'll see there that if the child is not a school age child or in school, then it, that may not be applicable. So these forms need to be completed by the appropriate professionals. Caregivers do have a piece of filling some of this information out, and then it needs to be reviewed and approved. So these are three ways that a child can be found physically disabled. And as you go through the UAS tool, each population has its own selections that you are determining that you have gathered the appropriate documentation. <coughs> Excuse me. The next population is the developmental disabilities and medically frail um, children. So again, you'll see that it's ages zero to 21 birthday, and then um, determine medically frail by a subset of questions in the CANS algorithm. And then the child has developmental disability as defined by OPWDD, which meets one of the criteria A through C below, as well as the criteria D, E, and F. So this is a process that OPWDD goes through to determine that somebody is de uh, developmental disability. <coughs> Excuse me, has a developmental disability. <coughs> And then you can see the selection in the UAS. Now, it's important to note that, and some of you who work in the care at home programs today understand that some children do meet the medically frail criteria of the target population, and some children <clears throat> also meet the DD med frag um, criteria. And some families have used um, both of the waivers. They may be in one waiver and then move to another waiver. So 
<clears throat> if um, you have the necessary information for the medically frail target population, then you can go through that door, so to speak, in the UAS and complete the medically frail um, eligibility if you have that information readily available. So there is um, an option to get those services. Um, otherwise, to get the DD Med Frag, you would have to go to OPWDD and the DDRO completes this eligibility for the target population. And that may take some time and additional information that you may have to gather. So you do have an option as you're working with families and that you are obtaining the information that will meet a target population that you may be able to go through one or um, the other door, um, depending on where the family is at and the documentation that you have. And the MedFredge door may be quicker to get families and children into services. The important thing to note here is that at the bottom of the slide, that if the, you do work with the child and family to get them eligible for HCBS level of care through the medically frail um, target population, that if a child is believed to have a DD condition, that we want children to be able at some point to go to OPWDD and determine whether or not they have a developmental disability so that when they reach their 21st birthday, they, we will know if they're already eligible for OPWDD services, and then they can go to the adult, um, um, the OPWDD waiver, and then have a, a <clears throat> an easy way to get into that waiver services. Um, and it's important that everyone understands that DD really needs to be determined um, before their 21st birthday. And the last population is DD foster care. So this is exactly the same as DD MedFrag in the sense that um, the criteria for DD needs to be defined by OPWDD through the criteria outlined through A through C and then D, E, and F. So <clears throat> I just didn't want to repeat myself, but you can see A, B, and C are diagnoses. Um, so there are, is information there of the type of diagnosis that they could have. So you need one of those in A, B, and C. And then you need um, originates before the child um, obtains the age of 22. And then E is has continued or can be expected to continue indefinitely. So they have a diagnosis, it's determined before the age of 22, and it has been determined that the child will have this condition um, long term. And then the last piece is also an and constitutes a substantial handicap to such children's ability and functioning normally in society. So once again, remember, this is um, services of HCBS are for children with high needs. <clears throat> so this criteria is the same for DD MedFrag as it is for DD foster care. And you can see the selection there in the UAS. Now, the target populations of DD MedFrag and DD Foster Care are the two populations that will be determined by OPWDD DDROs. There will need to be communication processes established between the health home care managers and CES and the DDROs to be able to communicate with one another and provide the information so that DD uh, MedFrag or DD Foster Care can be determined. We are working with OPWDD to have a secure electronic process in place so that as health home care managers and CES 
obtain the necessary information to determine that someone is um, <clears throat> eligible for one of these target populations, that that information can be sent to the regional DDRO so that they can have that determination. They are providing or will provide a checklist that will outline the types of documents and information that you will need to gather to make that referral to the DDRO. The DDRO will actually have access to the UAS. They're being trained now, as well as <clears throat> on the HCBS tool. And they'll have access to the tool, and when they get your referral and the supporting documentation, there is an opportunity where they can go into the UAS and complete the eligibility tool for you, or that you can go through the tool, and then once you get the information back from the DDRO, that you can then complete the tool based on their, their report back to you. So this is a joint process to get someone eligible. Currently in the waivers today, this is the process through the foster care DD as well as the DD MedFrag. Our, our goal here was to make sure that there is a consistent process so that everybody is aware of how to do that, that it can be as electronic as possible, and that um, the DDROs also have access to the UAS so that they can assist the care managers in CES in completing the determination for you. So that's very important. There still needs, though, the responsibility of the care manager and CES to make sure that all the documentation is in the care uh, in the child's record. So as I said, <clears throat> we're coming up with a process so that there's communication and there is a way to share documentation as well as to ensure that um, the level of care determination is made quickly and that you are able as a care manager or CS to be able to communicate with the family what is occurring with their eligibility and when they are found eligible or not eligible for HCBS LOC. So that is the target populations. There's four of them. And so you'll see each of the criteria that we went through needs some type of diagnosis as well as functional limitation support and documentation on how to determine the um, populate target population. The next step, once you have that piece um, of the decision tree, is to go to the risk factors. And once again, it's really important that you obtain the proper documentation to support the risk factors. Two of the target populations have specific risk factors, um, <clears throat> and that is the SED and the DD of foster care. And again, I can't say this enough, it's important, I will show you those risk factors, that you have the supporting documentation. For the other three populations, and I say three because SED has this as well, so SED has um, an additional risk factor plus what we're calling the LPHA attestation, which is the Licensed Practitioner of the Healing Arts attestation. So these three populations of SED MedFrail and DD MedFrail, you need an LPHA to attest so we have a form um, that without these services, the child um, is at risk of a, going to a higher level of care or a more restrictive setting. There is a place within the UAS for you to document that you have obtained that um, form and that it's completed and that it's signed with the license number of the licensed practitioner of the healing art, and they need to date it. And within the UAS, you will enter the date.
So for SED, as I mentioned, they have two things that need to be completed. The first thing is the child needs to meet one of the one through four factors. So um, the child, number one, is the child is currently in an out-of-home placement, including a psychiatric hospital, or the child has been in an out-of-home placement, including a psychiatric hospital within the past six months or the child has applied for an out-of-home placement, including a placement in a psychiatric hospital within the past six months, or the child is currently in a multi-system or is multi-system involved, meaning two or more systems, has complex needs and services to remain um, successful in their community. Out-of-home placement as well as multi-system is defined at the bottom of the slide. So our goal here is with SED is that you have a mental health diagnosis, you have a licensed practitioner who has determined that they meet some functional limitation as defined in target population. And in addition, they have one of these four items where it shows that the child is either at risk of being in a high play, uh, higher level of care or has recently been in a higher level of care setting or currently is in a higher level of care setting. And we wanna get that child back into the community with supportive services. And then the end here is that then the licensed practitioner of the healing arts needs to sign and attest that without these services, the child um, may go or be at risk of going to a higher level of care, institutionalization or hospitalization. Now, a child who is already involved with mental health practitioners getting services or if they're in a higher level of care can assist you in completing the requirements and the documentation you need for your target population, your mental health diagnosis, meeting the functional limitations, and then the SED determination. Clearly, they would be able to answer one of the four questions for you to tell you that. <coughs> And then, excuse me, they could attest as the licensed practitioner of the healing arts on our attestation form to support that again, these services are needed, HCBS services are needed to either allow the child to remain in their community and in their home safely, or that they can leave a higher level of care to return home and in their community safely. And you'll see in the UAS, these one through four questions are here. If everything is no, you won't be able to move forward if you have an ES as outlined and you have your attestation with the signature date, then you will be able to move on to the next part of um, the determination for HCBS. The only risk factor for the medically frail target population is this attestation from a licensed practitioner of the healing art. Also for the developmental disability medically frail child as well, their only risk factor is the attestation of the LPHA. So for SED, MedFrag, in DZ MedFrag, you need an attestation that the state has um, pr will provide this form where a licensed practitioner of the healing arts will need to attest that without HCBS services, the child will not be able to return home safely or will potentially be at risk to a higher level of care. This documentation would have to be obtained yearly on an annual basis or any time the HCBS eligibility determination is um, made. So. 
Then our DD foster care risk factor, they are not required to have an LPHA form, but they need to meet one of one of these two factors. Either the child is currently in foster care with the local departments of social services, or the child's in the custody of OCFS, um, DJJ Joy, <clears throat> which is their juvenile justice, or a child, a foster care child was enrolled in HCBS when they were in the custody and there's no break in services and the child continues to be eligible for HCBS. So the goal here is for children who are in foster care that meet one of the target population and they just need to be in foster care, so there needs to be documentation that they're in foster care and that they're either with the local departments of social services or OCFS Division of Juvenile Justice. Or a child may have been in foster care, was eligible for HCBS, and then maybe they were adopted or they went home to their parents or other family members. If they continue to receive their HCBS and continue to be eligible, then they can continue to have HCBS services up to the age of 21. However, if there is a break in their coverage, so at some point the family or the child decides that they no longer want HCBS or they no longer become, uh, they no longer are eligible for HCBS, then if they want to come back to be determined eligible for HCBS, then this is a target population that they would not be able to meet. So this is our goal to keep continuity of care for those children who are transitioning out of foster care. And this is very similar to the current OCFS waivers. And you can see the two questions in the risk factor for DD foster care. So once again, this is a decision tree process and you have um, target population, the risk factors, and then the functional criteria. Remember that documentation is needed for all of the steps of this leg of the tree um, as you move forward. And for the level of care functional criteria is a subset of the CANS tool that is completed by the Health Home Care Manager or CES for SED and MedFRAG. So once again, for SED MedFRAG, the Health Home Care Manager and, and or CES would complete the target risk and the functional criteria, which is a subset of the CANS questions with all the supporting documentation to determine whether or not the child meets level of care. For target populations of developmental disability med medically frail and DD foster care, these are determined by the DDRO through OPWDD. So this is a communication between CS and the health home care manager to make sure all the documentation and supporting information is provided so that the DDRO can complete the HCBS level of care determination for the family. And you'll see there that again, SED and MedFRAG is a subset of the CANS. And this is what it looks like, is basically a subset of the CANS through our algorithm has been pulled over into the HCBS determination. If you pick one of these two target populations for DD MedFRAG, remember that it's through OPWDD plus OPWDD will also be completing a subset of the CANS questions. And then um, you'll see in the tool, it says that this information must be obtained by the DDRO first before the CANS questions can be answered. 
So again, this is a joint venture between the health home care manager, CS, and the DDRO. So either if the health home care manager or the CS wants to do the UAS tool, then they'll gather the supporting documentation from the DDRO, or the DDRO can go into the UAS and complete the HCBS eligibility, and then the health home care manager or CES will be able to see the outcomes of whether or not the child is eligible. So we just wanna talk quickly about Medicaid eligibility. And um, more of this information will be provided in the upcoming webinar about CES. But children and adolescents, as we mentioned, um, who are already in Medicaid are gonna be referred to the health home. And then children who are not in Medicaid will be referred to CES. And then CES will be able to gather that information and work with the family to assist with the target risk and functional criteria to determine whether or not the child meets HCBS level of care. That information is needed for the local departments of social services or HRA in New York City to assist them in determining Medicaid eligibility. If the child is not found community eligible for Medicaid, then the family of one um, budgeting would then be considered to make that child eligible for HCBS under the family of one. So it's really important that our goal here um, with the upcoming webinar with CES is to have a consistent process across the, uh, the state that um, CES would determine whether or not with the help of the DDROs to determine whether or not the child is eligible for HCBS and then assist the family with completing the Medicaid application to um, get that to the local departments of social services um, to ensure that um, they are either community eligible or found family of one. And then after that time is determined, then the family will have a choice to stay with CS or go to health home care management to then have their HCBS services and plan of care coordinated and developed. So just a couple of things about the UAS. So we have tried to automate a lot of this um, process. So it's in one system consistently. Um, target risk and the functional criteria have to be met for HCBS to be met. And then if um, the child does not have Medicaid, then as I just mentioned, um, CES will be able to print out the information that is needed for the LDSS and HRA to determine Medicaid eligibility. They will then be able to go into the UAS tool with um, the Medicaid SIN number once the child receives Medicaid and then proceed with determining um, the linkage to um, health home care management and the plan of care. I also need to note that we are having a capacity management webinar on the 27th of March. And um, starting April 1st, any child that is determined HCBS eligible will need to come and get approval through DOH capacity management team to see if there's an available slot um, for that child to receive services. So as health home care managers, CS, complete their HCBS eligibility, we will have a process that we're outlining in that webinar of how you'll find out if there is available slot for the child who's found eligible. 
One of the other things that the UA's team has worked um, diligently is that if you are already working with a family and they already have a completed CANS, since the CANS for, is used for some of the target populations, you would not need to redo a subset of those questions. You can do what's called linking to a CANS. Um, so there's lots of information around that. Um, also some stipulations about how that works. So I will tell you that if you have not gotten the email, if you're in the UAS and you have not gotten an email iHands today, you will get one shortly because the reference documents and the trainings for HCBS um, will, are ready and will start to um, be announced so that you can go get that UAS official training on how to determine HCBS eligibility. So once you have gone through target risk and the functional criteria, there's this summary here, which is the outcomes. And they will, the first one is a drop down that will be automatically populated. HCBS slash LOC eligible will say yes or no. It will say yes or no based on the target populations you did or did not pick. So if you picked SED and you did the target risk in the functional for SED, it will tell you yes or no there and the other three would be no. You will need to sign um, those outcomes similar to the CANS. So you can see how it's populated there. This child is eligible for HCBS under the SED waiver. You also see that in the middle there, it's kind of hard to see, but you also have to talk to the family that once you tell them that they're eligible, you need to ask them if they want services and document that. And then you will sign and finalize the outcomes. And in red, it says up there, um, until these outcomes are signed, that is what populates the one-year eligibility for HCBS. So that's the clock within the UAS. And just a reminder, as a child is found eligible for HCBS, that they're eligible for the entire array of HCBS um, services. And again, that you need to contact our DOH capacity management team to determine if there is a slot available. There's lots of reasons for that. We are managing overall all the slots. We're tracking family of one processes. We're making sure that RE codes are placed on files and that for auditing purposes, things are in place. So once again, if you wanna learn more about what happens or what you need to do after you've determined some uh, child is HCBS eligible, you will um, learn more about that process on March 27th. So at this day, we're working really diligently to try to get information out to all of you. Um, so there has been a refresher by MCTAC and um, our other state partners each Friday in March, so two have gone by, about the HCBS services, because if you're gonna do a person-centered um, plan of care with families, you need to know the types of services that will meet the needs of the family. We've had one consumer webinar and we've asked all our providers, health home care managers and health homes to inform the families and the children that you work with that there is another consumer webinar happening on March 21st, which is a Thursday. So if um, families don't have access to a computer to be able to access the webinar, we're inviting or encouraging providers to host um, families to do a web the webinar at your agency. We also are planning in-person regional consumer forums, so that will hopefully be announced soon. As I mentioned, the independent entity um, and how they will operate starting on April 1 in capacity management. We are also talking to our local departments of social services, and then we are also gonna 
be having some information for all of you regarding plans of care and authorizing services. So I know that was a lot of information, and I can see that there's a lot of questions um, <clears throat> that we can hopefully answer some of those. For you. So there's a question about, can you explain the process for HCBS for children or youth who are in RTF, RTC, or inpatient hospital? So similar to health home, 30 days prior to discharge, a health home care manager or CES can work with that family and those providers to determine whether or not the child is eligible for HCBS and um, assist with discharge planning so that when the child is um, returned back to their home and community that they can have services in place. So children can be determined um, HCBS eligible um, prior to discharge. So there's a question about is a child who is developmentally disabled and not in foster care eligible? So unfortunately, no. So as um, we said in the beginning, we have combined the current six waivers and the only DD that is in one of the six waivers is DD foster care. So OPWDD has a DD waiver. So a child who meets developmental disability would have to go to OPWDD to see if they're eligible for that HCBS waiver with OPWDD. So there's a question about, so while the CANS and the HCBS eligibility date aren't, aren't necessarily connected, change child's condition status requires both a new CANS and a new HCBS determination. So there is a significant life event um, where you have to do an earlier CANS than six months. And there is a significant life event, and they're very, the lists are very similar. There are some differences um, where an HCBS eligibility would need to be done. So yes, you potentially would have to redo the CANS and the HCBS, but if you remember, two of those populations are a subset of the CANS, and you can link them together. So that may be um, essentially more work, but there are some opportunities there because when there is a significant life event in a child's life, one, you need to review their person-centered plan of care, right? So you have to update your assessment, which is the CANS, and then you also have to determine whether they still remain HCBS eligible. So the CANS and the HCBS eligibility tool are for two different purposes. So yes, you would need to complete them. So somebody's asking if there's a hard copy, will a hard copy of the questions needed to be completing the LLC be given to care managers? <coughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, we definitely can do that. I'm not sure what the question, if the questions for risk factors and things like that, we definitely um, can share that. It's also in our waiver. We have, um, we can put that information in our HCBS manual for you. So we can definitely provide something if something would be helpful to you. If you would call your state agency or um, your DOH liaison so that you can give us some ideas of what you're looking for, then we can try to assist and accommodate you.
So someone is a health home approved SED verification form completed by a, a, a licensed professional sufficient documentation for HCBS eligibility? No. So HCBS eligibility, there is an attestation form that needs to be completed. It's a requirement that form will be given to you um, for it to be completed. And um, it has to be from a licensed practitioner of the healing arts that can diagnose. Now, can you use the HCBS eligibility attestation form of the licensed practitioner um, of healing arts for health home? Yes. So somebody's asking a question about an Article 31 item in OLP, so I don't know if Meredith or someone wants to answer that question. I don't know which one you're on, but I would think that we would focus on the HCBS questions and that person could um, email the Behavior Health Transition Inbox or OMH to get the answer for something um, that's not this topic. So maybe I can read the question. I mean, there are some things um, um, like that. Can OLP be used to gather the necessary information for the HCBS eligibility? Oh, so there. So it's HCBS related question. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. The OLP, an OLP who is a licensed practitioner, can gather the information. But again, the, sig the, the signatory on an HCBS um, eligibility as, uh, factors, whether the target population and the risk factors, needs to come from an LPHA who has the capacity to diagnose within their scope of practice. So it wouldn't be the full list of allowable OLPs. It would only be those that have within the scope of their practice the ability to diagnose. Thanks, Meredith. <clears throat> For developmental disability and medically frail, do we need to do both the medically frail full eligibility process and OPWDD eligibility determination, or is it acceptable that the medical diagnosis is attested in the UAS and a copy of the record. Okay, so that's very convoluted, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. So if you want to go through um, the target population of the medically frail, then that is what you can do, right? So you would do the target population, you would have the LPHA, so you would have the physical disability, um, one of those processes, SSI, the LDSS form, et cetera. You would have the LPHA form um, attested to, right, and documented in the UAS, and then you would complete, you, the health home care manager or CES, would complete the subset of the CANS questions, and then HCBS would then be determined. So you don't have to go to OPWDD for MedFrag only. And if, as I mentioned there, if you um, believe that a child has the DD and MedFrag, you can go through the MedFrag target population um, without going to OPWDD if you so choose. So there's a couple OPWDD questions, and I do apologize. I don't know um, if OPWDD has someone on the phone. So I'm gonna take that silence as no. So I apologize, we're not all in the same building. So we will get those questions to OPWDD and make sure that people are aware of the answers because I do not have the answer to that. I apologize. So Colette, I'm just going to, if I can answer one of the questions. One of the questions yeah. was, are community, are children's community residents youth excluded from HCBS eligibility? So um, a child cannot receive HCBS while they're in the community residence because 
um, those, the, the, uh, the children have to be in their home or the community, and the community residence is actually considered a restricted setting by CMS but they are eligible for HCBS upon discharge. So as Colette mentioned earlier, um, depending on the, the Medicaid status of the child, if they're Medicaid, it would be the health home. If they're non-Medicaid, it would be the uh, CES, the independent entity. They do have the capacity to um, go into um, the community residence to make an HCBS eligibility determination in preparation for discharge uh, so that they can be in receipt of HCBS services when they return to their home and community uh, um, after the CR. So Meredith, there's this other question. Um, for SED population, what documentation would be needed to prove the risk factor of multi-system complex needs? Um, so um, if it's the care manager, the care manager should have a, a strong working knowledge of the varied uh, systems in which the child is engaged in. If the child is on probation and therefore um, involved in the juvenile justice system, if their family is engaged with child welfare or CPS, um, if, uh, if there's, uh, you know, other, if they're uh, co-occurring substance use and have, have been in the varying uh, facilities, um, these types of pieces of information would uh, constitute, and, and the list is on the slides as, as uh, Colette went over, but these would constitute other uh, child-serving systems, um, and, and so they could verify that um, with the family and, and certainly, um, or with the treating, you know, uh, clinician if they happen to have that information as well. And that would just be documented that they're engaged with those systems and the information on their plan of care uh, would reflect that. And then um, that would be able to be, uh, reflected on um, the LPHA attestation once that information is either shared with the licensed practitioner or the licensed practitioner is aware of it. And I think Colette mentioned there is going to be a document that's going to be um, shared that would, would uh, facilitate the LPHA piece. Is that correct, Colette? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so there's a question, is the tool available right now to current health home care managers and is there mandatory training? So the tool will not be ready till April 1 because you can't do the tool prior to that because the current waiver and the current waiver processes for HCBS LOC is still in pro um, place until March 31st. There is required training. As I mentioned, there should be an IHANS going out, which is the email system for anybody who is in the UAS that will tell you that some of the training um, in the reference reading and those types of things are going to be up. So if you didn't get that today, you'll be getting it shortly today or tomorrow. And that training um, right now is just recommended until March 31st, and then it will be um, <clears throat> then it will be mandated or required, I should say. And so on April 1st, if you have not done the training, you um, won't be able to access your CANS and or HCBS until you do the required training. So that's just the process of how the UAS works. The other thing I want to be really clear, I'm going to just restate what was on um, one of the slides, is not all children in health home would be eligible for HCBS. So we really want to caution, you know, health home care managers, you know, doing the HCBS eligibility determination on every child, um, you know, and you should think about what the high needs are, how are they going to meet that target population, what are the services that they would need um, through HCBS, et cetera. The other thing is, you know, we are going to have that capacity management webinar on the 27th. So there is slots, right? And so once slots get full, there's a wait list. So we really want those children who need the services to be in the services. And then if we ever do get to a wait list, which I'm hoping we don't, but if we do, then we want children on the wait list that really need the services. We don't want to bottleneck um, capacity management because we did a determination on everyone. The other thing is not all children in health home would be found eligible anyways, so that's also extra work on your part. <clears throat> 
So someone's asking who's responsible for completing the UAS HCBS. So again, the only people that can complete the HCBS LLC determination, gathering all the paperwork as well as completing the tool in the UAS is health home care managers, CES, which is the independent entity, and our DDRO. Once you have completed the three components, because this is the other part of the question, the three components of target, risk, and functional, it will tell you that whether or not the child is HCBS eligible. So somebody's asking, is foster care one of the requirements for DD foster care? So yes. So that is, again, one of the risk factors that the child has to be in foster care or had been in foster care when they received the services. Um, there's a question that says, can a child who's non-Medicaid through CS possibly be eligible for HCBS services with a mental health diagnosis and an IEP alone. Um, I just want to remind people that there are three legs to the stool, so they would need to have SED, which is a diagnosis plus functional deficits. They need to meet um, the risk factors, meaning that they are at risk of out-of-home placement, hospitalization, are engaged in multiple child-serving systems um, that put them at risk. Um, and they would also need to meet the HCBS functional uh, limitation, functional determination uh, as per the CANS New York. Um, so um, if, if someone um, thinks that a child uh, was in need of HCBS and they are non-Medicaid, they should absolutely refer them to CS, and that would be a, a CS would make that determination themselves. Um, but if you think that the child uh, needs the service and are at risk, absolutely refer them to CS, and CS would make that determination. So there is about, I want to say, a half a dozen questions or so about CS, um, slots, capacity. So we're not going to answer those questions because we have webinars that are coming up that will hopefully answer all of those questions for you. I also want to just highlight for you that remember, we took our these six waivers and we put them into one. So many of the processes are the same. We're just streamlining those. So there are some questions about, well, this is what we do today. What will we need to do tomorrow kind of thing? So again, I would just, you know, um, find um, the population you serve today in the slides that we outlined, um, besides maybe some variation in documentation, um, you know, SED is SED. There's also um, about a dozen questions about what constitutes SED and um, a single qualifying condition for a health home. So um, I think that's just another discussion, and I want folks to understand that even though the health home SED, you need the diagnosis and the functional limitation, right, and the determination of SED is the same for HCBS, that does not mean every SED child in health home would be HCBS eligible. Um, so there's a question I'm trying to, how do CMAs that do not have HCBS make a referral for one of the several services offered? Can we make a referral straight to providers or does this need to still go through access? So um, <clears throat> what I'll say is once an HCBS eligibility determination has ma been made, then the health home care manager in CES will have to sit down with the family to develop a person-centered plan of care. And then based on the choices of the family, what providers and services they want, 
then yes, the health home care manager or CES would make direct referrals to any provider that the family picks. So if you're an agency that provides HCBS, that does not mean that the child and family will pick you as their provider of HCBS, even though you may be their health home care management provider. And so there will be another webinar coming up about plans of care and referrals to services and things like that. We did, um, about a year ago, put out a workflow webinar. and. Um, besides the managed care piece, much of that webinar and how referrals are made um, and the contact between health home care managers and the HCBS providers are very similar, if not the same. So there's a question confirming that even if a child is previously approved for HCBS, a significant life event will require a new one, even though they are already eligible for all HCBS services. So um, I think I understand the question. So the child is currently HCBS eligible and come April 1 or after the child goes into the hospital, let's say. So, um, yes, then the HCBS eligibility, even though they're in services, right, HCBS services, they would need to do an HCBS eligibility determination probably 30 days before they get out of the hospital, um, determine that they are still eligible for services. And I believe um, some of those criteria are in some of the existing waivers today. So once the child is eligible and it is referred to HCBS, does the health home care create the plan of care? Does the HCBS provider also complete a parent? So again, we're going to have to do a little refresher on the workflow, but after the child is HCBS, eligible, um, then yes, the health home care manager or CES would be sitting down with the family to develop the plan of care for that child and then work with the family about um, what are the services and the providers that they want to provide the services to meet their needs. And then the health home care manager would make the appropriate referrals um, to those HCBS providers, and then they are managing the plan of care. So it looks like um, we're beyond time here. Um, and I don't, is there anything else that you see, Meredith, that you can answer? There's a lot of questions about um, health home, so I'm not going to answer those. I apologize. No, I think we got the main ones that were very common, and I think that um, given the time, um, we can, you know, always clarify more on, on future uh, events. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for your time today. I hope this was helpful. This is an overview, clearly, of how um, HCBS LOC will be determined. As I mentioned, if you're a health home care manager, CS, or the DDRO in the UAS, you should be getting an iHands email if you haven't already saying what reference sheets and other trainings about HCBS will be um, up there for you to be trained. All the training for HCBS must be completed by March 31st. Otherwise, you on April 1st, you will not have access to complete work within the UAS. So that's just important to note. All right, and with that, thank you everyone for joining and have a good rest of your day.